In July 2014, IWM London staged Truth and Memory, British Art of the First World War, the first major retrospective of art created in response to the war for almost a century. Truth and Memory formed an integral part of the IWM's First World War centenary programme. It also coincided with the relaunch of the redeveloped IWM London site. I'm Richard Slocum, Senior Curator of Art and the Curator of Truth and Memory. The exhibition occupied our two permanent galleries at IWM London. The exhibition comprised almost 200 works of art, that was painting, prints, drawings and sculptures. And these mainly came from our renowned art collection. And these are works that originated under the seminal official war art schemes that Britain ran during the First World War. Truth and Memory sought to show how British artists of all ages, all traditions and all backgrounds strive to represent the unprecedented era-defining events of the First World War, which ultimately helped shape the nation's perception of the conflict and of warfare itself. The exhibition presents a new interpretation of the British First World War art, placing it firmly within the context of the times, taking into account the critical and popular responses and incorporating contemporary artistic debates. The second half of the exhibition showed how British art met the challenge of commemorating the First World War and how this helped form the collective memory of the war as we know it today. In doing so, it addressed why some pictures have seemed to transcend definitions of art and come to epitomise the slaughter and sacrifice of the First World War. While we were in the early stages of planning Truth and Memory, we were approached by York Museum Trust regarding the possible collaboration as part of the First World War Centenary Partnership, of which IWM leads. The catalyst for collaboration, aside from the centenary itself, was partly York Museum's Trust redevelopment of York Art Gallery, including the expansion of some of the first floor galleries. York Art Gallery has a fantastic World War I painting by Richard Jack, Return to the Front, so we approached Imperial War Museum about doing an exhibition, including that painting and a number of key works from their collection as well. Right, well, welcome to the IWM Art Store, Lorna. That's, uh, as you can see, we have almost 2,000 paintings in here. Well, Lorna, this is House of Glory by C.R.W. Nevinson. And prior to the First World War, Nevinson fell under the spell of the Italian Futurist Movement, a movement that was committed to all things modern, fast and violent. And it's a very shocking image, actually, and I understand that the War Office tried to censor it. Yes, I mean, they succeeded in censoring it. It was painted in 1917, just after the Passchendaele Offensive, a very costly offensive for the Allies, and at the time the mood in the country was very low, and it was felt that a painting of, of this sort was bad for morale, essentially. It showed the failures of this offensive, basically. And a censor, a chap called Major Lee, placed an injunction on it, essentially, banned it from public display because Nevinson, he was all ever hopeful that that ban would be lifted and uh, right up to the 11th hour he was intending to show it and when that ban wasn't lifted, instead of removing it from display, he, he left it in the show and instead pasted the strip of gum strip across the painting and wrote the word censored. This was, a, was an act that got him into a fair bit of trouble actually. Not only had he exhibited a banned painting, he'd also used the word censored, which itself was censored. He was delighted to report back to his superiors that the controversy that uh, surrounded this, the displaying of this painting had generated record-breaking crowds coming to see his show. So what are we going to look at next? Well, it's another very large painting and perhaps one of the uh, finest paintings uh, we had in the First World War. And this is Paul Nash's The Men in Road. So Paul Nash was in the Hampshire Regiment and he went off to the front but actually had a, a kind of fortuitous accident and got sent home at a good point uh, for him. He certainly did, yes. He arrived at the, the front in May 1917 and he was initially um, very excited about being at the front. He was um, trying to get a better view of a bombardment occurring at night and climbed up to the parapet, uh, the trench, and then promptly fell into the trench and broke a rib. 
And that bombardment was basically a precursor to uh, the Messines offensive, which occurred while Nash was actually recuperating. And of course, uh, a lot of his, his regiment were killed in, in that campaign. So he was very fortuitous and, um, to have escaped that. And of course, in that recuperation period, he put on a show of um, his war drawings, and, which facilitated his own commission as a, an official war artist. And that was when his um, style and his viewpoint, his outlook on the war kind of changed after that. Very much so. I mean, he, he returned to his, his former positions in uh, November 1917. Uh, this was after the Messines Offensive and found the whole area completely decimated. He'd lost his colleagues and it was one of these sort of defining moments where he actually realised what this war was about. He always had this almost sort of spiritual, mystical sort of regard for nature, particularly trees. He saw this, this sort of violation of nature almost as a sort of wider you know, metaphor for the wider destruction of, uh, of the war, essentially. And uh, this became a sort of central theme of his work. And in doing so, he revitalised the English landscape tradition and, and made it a very sort of expressive genre. And it's something you can see in this painting, the men in road here with this sort of breaking storm of, of light, you, you really get a sense of, of a world in chaos, in maelstrom here, in, gripped by this modern industrialised war. Well, Lorna, this is the uh, Singer Sergeant Gallery, and this is William Orpen's The Unknown Soldier in France. So William Orpen was a, a leading portrait artist and this was a really important commission for him. Yes it was. It came at the uh, behest of uh, the Prime Minister David Lord George. What he was after was a permanent and suitable memento to commemorate the, uh, the Paris Peace Treaty, the Treaty of Versailles, that would uh, bring an end to the war and introduce the, the peacetime settlement. So Orpen already had this reputation of the sort of portrait painter of the Edwardian great and good. So he was seen as an ideal choice to produce group portraits of the uh, victorious allied leaders overseeing this, this settlement. So this is one of three paintings he produced. But what they hadn't reckoned upon was the effect that the war had had on Alpen, essentially. He'd, he'd gone out there as a, a war artist and seen what the war had done, um, how it had affected France, how it had affected the soldiers, how it had affected the, the, the French civilians. It had very much disturbed him, and the longer he was at the Paris conference, the more, well, disgusted he was at the, uh, the sort of machinations of the politicians. And, this painting was uh, it originally intended as a group portrait of the Allied generals and leaders about to enter the Hall of Mirrors here, but he stopped doing that and instead produced what was this very sort of heartfelt tribute to the, uh, the, the British soldier. What you can't see now, he had two kind of guards of honour here, which were these, these two very sort of emaciated British soldiers, and then above them there was a um, two, two cherubs um, carrying sort of garland there. It was a very sort of allegorical representation. And this was his sort of heartfelt tribute to the, the British Tommy. And it was a, a very popular picture with the British public. Uh, it was shown in 1923 at the Royal Academy and uh, voted the picture of the year. It was only in 1928 when Alpen decided to paint over the Guards of Honour and the Cherubs that um, it was actually accepted into Right, so it was only collection. many years later we came back it to was, it and yeah, changed it. And that yeah. was, was that the pressure, do you think? Yeah, I think Alpen had just sort of come to terms with it and decided to just go along with the museum's mm -hmm. wishes and, and uh, decided to paint over it. But he only painted over very thinly, and you can just make out some of the details. Oh, you can as well. Yeah, you can make out, and particularly on this one, you can make out the face yeah. there. So he didn't paint over it with conviction? No, he just sort of blocked them out, essentially. Okay, Lorna, this is uh, another one of our very special paintings. This is uh, Stanley Spencer's Travois arriving with the wounded. So can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in this painting? Certainly. Now, Spencer was a medical orderly in the uh, Salonika campaign in the Balkans in the First World War. Quite different from other representations in the exhibition, that it, it, it's a, not a Western Front scene. The scene that he experienced himself during in 1916 when the British attacked the, uh, the Bulgarian position, the attack occurred at night and uh, 
This is a scene of the wounded arriving back at a field hospital and you see surgery sort of taking part over in the uh, top corner there. So, really kind of spiritual work. Spencer, a very sort of idiosyncratic religious views. He's taken that theme on in, into this painting here where you, you see the actual wounded sort of arriving in in the sort of darkness and then the sort of brilliant light of the operating theatre here. So it's a sort of metaphorical sort of coming from the darkness, the chaos of war to the, the, the light and redemption of, of the, uh, the field hospital there. Well, this is a great opportunity to revisit Truth and Memory and to take it out of London and show it to a new audience. It also gives us the opportunity to show more of our larger works within the larger spaces at York Art Gallery. And it'll certainly give an impression of how some of the larger works would have looked in that proposed Hall of Remembrance. And it certainly will be the first occasion on, for almost 100 years, since 1919, that we've been able to bring so many of our larger First World War paintings together. Oh.